in Italian tradition, uh, mostly based in Cremona, Italy, started in fi the 1500s um, and kind of very active on up through, say, 1750. And so that's sort of the main source of uh, inspiration for the instruments that we built. Um, the first violin maker um, who kind of made the classic plan for the current violin, his name is Andre Amati, and he built in the 1500s. And uh, his successors, you've probably heard more about Stradivarius, Guarnerius. So those are the, the most famous uh, violin makers who kind of inspire the current world of violin making. And um, it just so happens that the instruments that I build are more based on the Stradivari model and the instruments that Matt builds are more based on the Guarneri model. So it kind of works out well. We represent both. <laughs> we, cover all. we cover all the ground. And, um, and they're very different instruments. I mean, to the untrained eye, you would look at them and they would say, oh, they're two, two you know, they're violins. What's, what's the big deal? Um, but if you know a little bit about instruments, you can easily look at the vi any violin and say, oh, that's a Strad model or that's a Guarneri model. Um, and it's all in the finer details, sort of knowing um, what to look for, for example. The shape of the F-hole varies between the two models. Hold up like a side view. See how this one is just like the classical kind of scroll shape and that one's a little kind of Fun less style. regular. You know? But see this is all like just this is just stylistic stuff, especially the scroll, you know. But yeah. even as far as like the um, the way the body is constructed, strides from the upper bow tend to dive down as far as the paper with with the um, with the ribs, whereas Grenari will taper one millimeter. That's the other thing. We work in millimeters. A tenth of a millimeter is a ton of wood, and it's all the matter in the world. So Grenari will start with a one millimeter taper from the bottom to the top, where you strive to kind of stay a little bit consistent here and then kind of dive forward. Mm -hmm. So well, it's Yeah, let's talk about making, because what we're talking about has like the more technical side of so making, okay. and uh, let's. Let's kind of... We're about to dork out on this, I hope y'all are ready. <laughs> the problem is if you start and you say, oh, that's good enough, I'm ready to move on, it's like a success, everything builds on the last thing that you did. So you get successively worse if you start, you know, kind of slacking. So it's, it's not for kind of like a faint-hearted... <laughs> Violin making is a very exacting uh, undertaking. You, like Matt said, you measure, you measure, To the tenth of the millimeter. So if you can picture how small a millimeter is, it's like barely letting light through your fingers. <laughs> and then divide that in ten. That's how you measure. Like a tenth of a millimeter is a sheet of loose. I mean, that's how you millimeter. measure right. the Wait. thickness of a violin. So oh, yeah. it's how many is that? How many a tenth is a sheet of paper, right? Uh, or is it less than that? I don't remember you said that. Check it on my you can check it on my camera. <laughs> But yeah, like, I mean, these things, these things are called riser sticks. And uh, it's part, this is like, uh, I still have these things and I'll never get, but if my house is burning down, I will really get these. Because these things took me forever. Everything right here is a perfect 90 degree angle and they're both exact at 10 millimeters all the way around. And I did all that. By hand. By hand with this bad boy right here. And, uh, it's you know, harder than you would think. Too. I mean, as Chris is figuring out, I'm having him make nice handles, basically, and having him make, you know, here's a knife, here's the handle. It's made out of two pieces of wood that are, you know, jointed in center. It's harder than you, than you think to make a flat joint, perfectly flat joint. Or you, you know, know, it takes days at first, and then over time you yeah, do it now. You don't even think about it, you know? Are you, are you kind of sore from having to use different muscles with your hands? Not really. No. After maybe the first day or second day I was a little bit but sometimes not even I've been doing the same thing for a while so and I'm not I'm, I'm making them get it right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, There's yeah, no slacking. That's, that's I haven't smashed anything yet and yeah, and so I can make it So yeah. <laughs> These right here, I was just about to start. And I, Anya has a rib structure right there in her hand, and that's, that's a 
completed rib structure. But these things, like I said, these are riser blocks. They're 10 millimeters tall. And um, how thick are your ribs when you start? I start at like 35 millimeters, somewhere around there. So what, what I do right here, once I have my form, we'll get to how we get to the form, but I'll answer David's question real quick. So the riser blocks, you put down on a flat surface, like that. So once you have that down, you'll take like a block of spruce, which I had somewhere around here, right here. Like this, this is spruce. And um, you pretty much take a wedge and split it. You gotta always make sure that your blocks are split. That's extremely, extremely important. Because if they're not split, and you go to start cutting the corners, shaping the corners with the gouge, yeah, you're in store for a good treat on that one. So, because it won't cut right, and it's, it's impossible to do, and the block will end up falling off, and you know, it's just nuts. Because I actually, I made a mistake one time of picking up the wrong block that wouldn't split, that I thought was split, and I was like, why is this thing not working? It bumps everywhere. So, once you have your, your, your form, which is this thing right here, sitting on your riser blocks, take like a hatchet or anything with a, a blade, like a wedge, split that wherever, and this is spruce, so you can see how the grains go, and then when it, a true piece is split, it will split right down on that grain. So you go off of that grain, and can you see the end grain right here? How it's kind of going like that? That always goes into the corner of the instrument, of this part. Notice how exacting everything has to be. Right here. You know, it's not like, oh, here's a piece of wood, I think I'll just throw it yeah. on that corner. Like, uh-uh, that's not going to cut it. It has to be the right kind of wood, it has to be, you know, cut from the tree a certain way, it has to be then cut into a block a certain way, then it has to be oriented onto the form a certain way. I mean, it's like, you know, this is, a, this is the classical method that I'm talking about. If you want to build a folk pile and, you know, the, it's endless variation of that, yeah. but uh, it's sort of like the classical model we're talking about. So, you know, and two, there's all kinds of kits too that are available that are pre-assembled and a lot of this stuff is kind of already done, so you know, you can just really enjoy and kind of just sail through it, you know, um, and they'll, you know, and two, you can also buy like pre-carved out tops, you know, everything pretty much, you know, I and I, because uh, we're, we're professional makers, so, I mean, the stuff that we make is totally like, you know, we get to pick and choose exact grains that we want for sound and stuff that you may get from there. You know, I've seen that, everything you can get from there, and it's generally not that good. It's way overpriced, you know. I mean, yeah. You know, you can buy it way cheaper and then make it yourself, and half the time and have it right and better. But let me back up real quick. There's two things that you have to do before you get to this form part right here. You have to come out with what's called an outline. And this can be made pretty much out of anything, out of plastic, like little flimsy things like this, or um, you know, big thick plastic, just anything that's not gonna move, warp, change, or any of this. You know, these things take a tremendous amount of time to make. To me, your outline is pretty much, you see, it all starts with the rise of blocks. You have to get those babies exact, and you can start to see stuff. Your, everything is dependent pretty much on your outline. All your weird stuff is gonna come from your outline. Eventually, you end up taking out the form after kind of to right towards the end of the assembly process. You take this out. It's remarkably easy to do. You just sort of pop, 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 and sort of slide it out around that form. It's actually surprisingly easy. And unless you're sloppy one night and forget to check the scrape the glue out. Right, right. Unless you, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it requires a little bit of a tap on a, on a hammer. I mean, usually it does. And you end up with this. This is the rib structure without that form in it, right? So you have those corners are still there. Uh, top, block, bottom, block, and more corners. Uh, you'll notice that there's some extra pieces of wood in here, right? Can you see that? These little, those are called lines, and those just kind of widen the width of the ribs to provide support uh, for glue. So you have the rib structure against that, you glue the back, and against that, you glue the top. This is high glue. And